Check, check one, two. Hello, is this thing on? Welcome, it's time to get the show started. It's time for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Hi, everybody. I am your host, Chris Smith, and it is good to be with you for the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Uh, smart folks gathering every Wednesday at noon to learn interesting things, meet interesting people, see what's going on out there in the world, and have the opportunity to chat and ask questions. It's what we're all about here at this program. Uh, this program is a broadcast service by us here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, but is coordinated and organized by the folks of the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality. All of us working together to bring you what is a fantastic series, a long running series, uh, just an incredible partnership that we have where we can talk about, you know, sometimes we talk about what's going on in nature and conservation, some cool and interesting science that's happening across the state of North Carolina. Uh, but since this program is organized by the Office of Environmental Education, we also hear from loads of environmental educators themselves, the people who are out there doing the work, and uh, sometimes, at least in this case too, sometimes doing the science around environmental education and interpretation, uh, programs, all of that stuff. Um, and in thinking about today's program and today's guest, it's really exciting. One, because... Chris Goforth works here with us at the Museum of Natural Sciences, and we are blessed to have Chris's skill and talent as an educator and programmer uh, and a scientist with us at the museum, uh, but also somebody who is thinking critically about how to make these things better all the time, whether it's uh, a citizen science program, like the ones that Chris operates out of the museum and collaborates on, or actually being out there in the field doing the work of talking to people about science and nature and conservation and the environment and more. And so everybody, if you haven't met Chris Goforth already, we'll do that now. Chris actually works here at the museum as the head of citizen science and joins me now. Hi, Chris. Hello. It's great to have you on the program. Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Uh, so I think you're you're not downtown at the museum. You work for the museum, but you're not right here in the middle of town with me. Where where do you happen to be? I am at Prairie Ridge Eco Station, and I have a really nice background up so you can't see the chaos that is our office. <laughs> <laughs> the chaos that is everyone's office. Yes, it, it, it's an adventure. <laughs> Especially if you're out there working on the prairie, like, and your job has so many different facets between programming and educating, uh, conducting research projects, but also just being out at the eco station. So many different jobs. Yeah, it's, it's a great place. You know, the the wildlife that we have out here is pretty spectacular. So it's, it's a really lovely place to be. I love it. Oh, and uh, before we get too deep, I don't know if you're going to talk about it. Didn't we just announce that we're doing some construction at Prairie Ridge soon? Uh, yes, we don't have an exact timeline on that, but we're trying to okay. build a education building um, so that we will have an indoor classroom and more bathrooms, which is actually really important, <laughs> um, and then some office space for the staff as well. So hopefully that will be coming in the not too distant future, but we don't know exactly when. Excited for that. Real excited for that. Okay. Uh, Chris, I'll turn the program over to you. Excited to hear your insights. All right. So um, what I am going to be talking about today is how the programs that um, I and my team did during COVID uh, or how COVID really changed, you know, what we did um, and then what changed again after COVID kind of moved through. So um, my job as a head of citizen science uh, includes a lot of different things. Uh, I do a lot of programming, so I do a lot of education. I am taking people out in the field and doing things with them. I'll talk about that here in a moment. I also do research. Uh, I um, do a lot of social media related to our citizen science program as well. So uh, I have kind of lots of different facets of my job. But um, the reason I'm here talking about this is because I do work at an E Center, and um, this is 
the place that I work. So this is the aerial view. Um, our little office trailer is right here. Uh, and we have only one like permanent building, which is this little building over here, which I'll show you a picture of in a moment. But we've got about 40 acres of um, land at this site. Uh, it has a variety of different habitat types. We've got a couple of ponds, we've got the prairie, we've got um, a creek that runs through our forested area here. So we've got um, a really good amount of wildlife. Um, a lot of things move through here. We're also connected via the Greenway to um, Shank Forest and Umstead and the big property around the airport, um, as well as the art museum. So we have some really pretty amazing wildlife. It's a really phenomenal place to work. Uh, it's a great place to get people outdoors uh, because the site's not really huge, but has a lot to see in a pretty compact space. Um, this is our only permanent building. This is our outdoor classroom. It's a really phenomenal building um, built by Frank Harmon, who's a, a world-renowned green architect. It's a very amazing building, but it is basically a really fancy screened in porch. Um, we don't have uh, any ways to adjust the temperature up and down very much. Uh, and so there are times of the year where it's unpleasant to work in this spot this space or to be in a program in this space. Uh, and we also don't have any ability to make this room dark. And so before COVID, we had no real ways of presenting things during the day. So evening programs were totally different. If you needed a PowerPoint presentation during the evening program, you just pulled the screen down, turn the projector on, and that would work, but it doesn't work during the day. And so our tech limitations are really, really significant at this site because we cannot make this room dark during the day. So a lot of what I did before COVID was figuring out how I would turn something that I might potentially use a PowerPoint presentation for, at least to supplement, into things that required no tech at all. Uh, and so we had some real limitations of what we could do at this site um, and put a lot of effort into avoiding PowerPoint or any sort of projected anything for pretty much every program. So I do a wide variety of different types of programs. So I do a lot of both drop-in and pre-registered educational programs. Uh, I do workshops for environmental educators and teachers. I really love working with educators of all types um, and getting them excited about the kinds of things that I'm excited about. And then I also uh, coordinate and run multiple citizen science events at Prairie Ridge every year. So we do um, the um, statewide star party, the city nature challenge, um, national moth week um, program, and a few others. Uh, so those are kind of a little bit larger scale, but still not huge. You know, they're like 200 to 400 people kind of things. Um, so not, not giant events, but they're, they're still a little bit more than a regular program. So I work with a lot of different types of people in a lot of different capacities. Uh, so my programs pre-COVID pretty much had the same set of characteristics. Um, all of them include citizen science in some capacity because that's my role at the museum. Uh, so every program that I do will at least mention a citizen science project, if not actually train you how to do a citizen science project. <clears throat> I also work with all ages except early childhood. We do have an early childhood specialist that works at Prairie Ridge. Um, and most of the time, the really young kids are not quite at a place where they understand like why citizen science is valuable or important or worthwhile. Um, so I, I avoid the very youngest kids, but pretty much anyone else is fair game. Uh, I do a really huge variety of different types of programs. I like to try to change things up and try new things. Um, I'm always willing to to try a crazy idea and see if it works. And then if it does, we do it again. And if not, you know, we move on and try something else. Uh, so I like to talk about a lot of different topics and a lot of different, um, a lot of different ways. I am an entomologist though. So I really like talking about insects in particular. So my insect programs are particularly exciting to me. Uh, all of our programs were in person pre-COVID. Uh, I had very limited ability to do any sort of virtual programs before COVID. And because of our space, everything was very low tech and basically no screens. Um, if I did need a screen and every every now and again I did, I had a series of iPads that I could hand out to people and they could all look at something on an iPad or I would sometimes actually like physically carry an iPad around to everyone and have them look at something. So everything was very, very, very low tech pretty much all the time. So I had goals for all my programs um, and these are what I really wanted these programs to accomplish. So um, I wanted all my programs to be hands-on, experiential, and actually out in nature. You know, we have this 
amazing outdoor facility with the museum. So we should be using that to get people learning about nature actually in nature. And I really like for people to take away from a program a skill or new knowledge that they can apply somewhere else. Um, I want people to learn natural history content. Um, one of the things that I've noticed with citizen science projects is that a lot of times that people don't feel comfortable with like how to identify a bird properly or how to collect the data um, in a way that makes sense to them. Um, and so they feel comfortable about the, the natural history part of it. Uh, they're not gonna do that project. So uh, the natural history content is a really important part of any program I do. So even if it's a program entirely focused on citizen science, I'm also gonna teach you natural history associated with that, that project. I want participants to walk away with skills, so they should at least know how to enter the data for a citizen science project or you know, identify a bird or a ladybug species. And I want them to walk away feeling like they can do a citizen science project on their own. So I want them to have enough information that they feel confident that they can do the project. Um, and I don't know if they ever actually go home and do these projects, but that's what I'm ultimately shooting for, that people feel like they have enough that they can do this project without my being there holding their hand. So that's what I did before the pandemic, but you all know that the pandemic changed everything. Uh, it completely changed the way we do everything. And you know, it's still impacting the way we're doing things now. So in my case, what this meant was that I went from writing things on chart paper and whiteboards and printing out handouts and not using screens at all, carefully avoiding PowerPoint to needing to do everything online, uh, which meant that suddenly I was in this entirely virtual space with all this tech that we had very, very carefully avoided for so many years. Um, and so one of the things that was a really big issue with COVID for so many people is that you really had to have access to the outside world. Um, you can't just decide you want to do a virtual program and people just happen to know that it's there. You have to be able to talk to people and let them know that these things are coming up and that they, they can take part in these things. Um, so happily for me, um, because I work at Prairie Ridge, we have this uh, Facebook page that we were able to use as a way to talk to people outside um, of our staff. Uh, and so we were able to promote um, our programs through this Facebook page. We really um, beefed up the number of posts that we were doing every week. You know, we used to post, you know, twice a week, maybe. And then we started doing daily posts so that we were engaging people more and more online. Uh, we built our followers from something like, I don't know, 900 followers to, you know, thousands um, over just a, a few months um, and started doing a lot of our programming through our Facebook page. And so this was a really, really essential thing for us, like having this conduit to the outside world. And so uh, we started doing these virtual programs. Um, I um, had to rethink my goals really significantly for this virtual space. So I still wanted them to kind of walk away with the same things that they always had. Uh, so I really want people to learn natural history content, that they should learn some skills, and I want them to feel like they can do a citizen science project on their own. But um, I added this extra goal, like obviously we couldn't be hands-on in person, you know, doing this experiential thing together because we couldn't be in the same space together during COVID. So what I wanted these programs to do is also be as interactive and social as possible because people were really starving for that human connection with people outside of their, their bubble. Um, and so that became an important part of what we were trying to do with our, our virtual programs. So I really wanted to do virtual programs before COVID um, and had not really built up the capacity to do them. Uh, and so this was a really good opportunity for me to actually start doing some of these virtual programs that I'd always wanted to do. Like I asked for a Zoom account four full years before the pandemic hit because I really wanted to start doing these, these programs online. You know, we're a statewide museum. I really wanted to be able to reach people outside of Raleigh. I wasn't able to make that happen before COVID, but during COVID, suddenly here was this opportunity to do some of these things that I'd always wanted to do anyway. So I was really ready to do virtual programs when COVID hit. So we closed on March 17th 
Um, I think that was a Tuesday. And the following Monday, I did my first citizen science adventure program. Uh, and what these were, were they were a paired um, set of programs. One was a kind of on-demand um, video on Facebook. So I would premiere this video every Monday uh, about a citizen science project. It was basically a tutorial on how to do the citizen science project and included all the natural history information that I would normally include in an in-person program. Uh, and people could watch that live. And I would have these um, hour long office hours basically where people could ask questions about the project um, live and get an answer right away. Uh, and then they could watch on demand after that. And then on Fridays, I had um, on Zoom a live chat with scientists. And so I invited scientists from these citizen science projects or scientists who worked with the data coming out of these citizen science projects to let people ask questions about, you know, why these projects matter, what's being done with the data, you know, those kinds of things. Um, and just have this kind of social informal chat with um, these scientists that were working with these data from these citizen science projects. And so um, these ended up being a huge amount of work because, you know, I had to create videos. I hadn't really done a whole lot of that before. You know, I was doing it with my phone and a uh, set of earbuds in my backyard. Um, but I created something like 28 of these. You know, it was it was a lot of these. You know, we all thought the museum would only be closed a few weeks. Um, I planned to have, you know, five weeks worth of these things originally and you know, I actually presented a plan to our community engagement people about what I wanted to do and had five weeks of, of plan. And then of course had to extend that significantly further. Um, but these, these worked really pretty well for me. Um, you know, we were having, you know, four or 500 people show up to watch the videos during the live stream and then other people would watch later. Um, we were maxing out our Zoom account. I had a hundred person Zoom account um, for um, most of the closure time during COVID. And we were getting to where we were having to turn people away, which I really hated to do. But I also really wanted to make sure that people could actually talk to each other and they could talk directly to the scientists. Um, and so these were working really pretty well for us. Um, I did really enjoy doing these quite a bit. Um, they sucked up a lot of time and, you know, there was a tendency to kind of doom scroll during, uh, during COVID. So this helped get me out of that space and thinking about things that were a little more positive. Um, I also started doing a lot of educational programs. So a lot of those programs that I would do as, you know, like a, a drop in or a um, scheduled program before I kind of transitioned into um, a Zoom space. So all those programs that I very carefully avoided PowerPoint on suddenly had to be entirely on PowerPoint. Uh, and so I had to ironically start thinking about using PowerPoint for the first time, uh, even though I had so many times grumbled about not being able to use PowerPoint before. Uh, so I turned things like my um, Intro to Bird ID program into a, a virtual program where we were um, training people how to actually identify birds and basically doing the same things we were doing in person, um, where we were like drawing a, a bird up on the, the um, chart paper and, and uh, having people look through field guides, but we were um, doing it all online. And it really worked pretty well. Uh, I did a lot of programs for the, um, the natural sciences classroom for the K-12 group that the museum was running. And then we had just started our Eco Explore Hub, which is a citizen science project run out of the North Carolina Arboretum for kids in grades K through eight, right before COVID hit. So we started doing a lot of kids programs through Eco Explore. Uh, and so those were really pretty highly interactive. We really wanted the kids to be able to, again, talk to each other, but, you know, we were having them do crafts and learn about um, um, bird calls and frog calls by making the calls themselves and, you know, just trying to make them as interactive as we possibly could. The, um, all those programs were great though, and I love doing them. I still love doing virtual programs, but uh, I started thinking about these events that I did every year. Um, you know, the City Nature Challenge, still happened in April of 2020, but it was a very different kind of feel because you know we couldn't have any in-person programs and that it happened anyway, but um, you know, it, it was a little bit different than usual. But I started thinking about the firefly event that I, or the big firefly program I do in June every year um, and wanted to think about a way that I might be able to do that. So um, I started thinking in, in May that maybe what I wanted to do was set my phone on a tripod in front of the, the prairie, 
talk about fireflies for like 10 or 15 minutes and then step off camera, let people just watch the fireflies over the prairie and then answer questions um, through audio only. And um, decided that this was maybe a crazy idea, but I really wanted to try. And so I tested out everything um, multiple times, you know, went out to Prairie Ridge, you know, I had to like ask permission to go to my office at the time. <laughs> so went out multiple times, set all my equipment up, you know, figured out um, how to best get everything set up, you know, got different earbuds, you know, made sure everything worked. Uh, it was all set to go. This was going to be a Facebook live event. And so we were going to um, just, you know, live stream on Facebook live. Uh, and then I had um, one of my coworkers set up at her home to be a moderator for the chat because I wanted people to be able to ask questions and then I would answer them uh, live on air. And so um, we were all ready to go. Of course, the day of that event, there was like this giant storm rolling in that I was so worried that it was going to hit like right in the middle of the program. It, it waited until 10 minutes after the program to actually hit. So I had managed to actually get all my stuff thrown into my car before it started downpouring. Uh, that was also when the Black Lives Matter Black Lives Matter um, curfews in Raleigh were happening. And I knew my program was going to get me home like right before the curfew. I made it home one minute before the curfew started that night. Um, so there were all kinds of things that were happening aside from the technical problems that I had. Nothing worked that night. Um, I had tested it so many times and everything stopped working. I couldn't get my audio to work at all. Uh, and it was just mass chaos having my question um feeder in another site was not ideal um but we did it and it went over really well we had um 2200 people show up to this program uh, and they were people from all over the world um you know i'm so used to talking to only north carolinians or occasionally you get someone from another state that's visiting and just happen to see a program and, and join it kind of last minute um, so I was I was talking about these fireflies and where I was in a way that was very like North Carolina focused, but I kept getting questions about you know like where I was. Uh, and so you know I said hey, I'm here at Prairie Ridge, you know it's in Raleigh, and there were people that were asking where that was. I said oh well it's you know in Central North Carolina, and then got other people asking it well where's North Carolina? I'm like okay this is this is a much different kind of audience than what I'm used to. So we ended up with people from uh, like Malaysia, Australia. Um, places in Africa, England, it, it was pretty amazing to have so many people watching these fireflies over our prairie. Um, and it wasn't even all that great of a firefly night just because we had the storm moving in. But um, I talked for an hour straight about fireflies. Once I got off camera because of my audio issues, I was literally hunched over my phone, like with my face, like three inches away from the microphone for the rest of the hour. It was uncomfortable and unpleasant for me, but I think it went over really well. So then I decided I wanted to turn my moth night into another virtual program, but I wanted to do it a slightly different way. Me talking for the whole hour was really a lot. Um, and so what I wanted to do for my moth night was have multiple people being the speakers. And so I basically sent out a call to all of my coworkers and um, had this crazy idea that we would all get on Zoom together. Everyone would be at their own homes with their own lights and they would basically be moving around with their, their phone um, on Zoom. And we would cycle through people so that multiple people were showing off moths at their houses. Um, I was really worried that I wasn't going to have enough to talk about for the entire program, that we would just have the same, you know, six moths on the sheet the whole time. And I would run out of things to say. But by having lots of other people involved, we would always have something interesting for people to look at. And so this ended up being like really logistically complicated because I had, I think, uh, I think it was 12 people that were on air um, and they were all at their own homes with their own lights. Uh, we had to have a moderator. So um, the moderator was looking at the Zoom chat, which only our presenters were on. Um, and you would basically just type in, I have something to share and she would call on you and you would show off your thing. And if you had anything to say about that moth or that insect that you were looking at, you could. And we basically just, you know, cycled through everyone and always had something interesting to look at that way. Um, but then we also had people in the background. So we had people that were pulling comments off of the Facebook chat that were putting them in our Zoom chat. Everyone was watching it on Facebook Live. 
Um, and so we had the people connecting those two platforms together. So we knew which questions people were asking so we could answer those when we didn't have anything like particularly interesting to, to look at. Uh, and then we also invited people to send in moss photos so that we could help them identify them. So we wanted people at their homes to be looking at their, their moths. And we did end up getting quite a few people sending in photos that night. So this one is kind of um, logistically complicated because there were so many people involved and we had multiple platforms and we had volunteers helping with the, the chat. Um, and moving chat questions over from Facebook to Zoom. We had people that were identifying things in the background and I was running around like a crazy person the whole time. Thank God I did not decide to be the moderator also because that would have been a disaster. Uh, Kelly Lewis from the Whiteville Museum did that and did an amazing job. Um, but we ended up with over a thousand people at our moth night too. Um, and it was two hours long, something like 300 of those people were there for the full two hours uh, watching us talk about moths. Uh, in various places across North Carolina. And so I really loved that event. Um, I thought it went really well. You know, there was something for people to see pretty much continuously. Uh, and so it was a way to take the burden off of any individual site and any individual person from having to present the entire time um, and gave the audience a much better experience because they could see so many different things in so many different places. You know, potentially someone in like, um, southeastern North Carolina would see something at the Whiteville people staff and then we had some people that were in uh, Greensboro and I think we had someone that was even further west so you know there were lots of different areas of the state represented. We ended up doing a few more of these we did one for the um, Great Backyard Bird Count and a few other things um, and every time I felt like they went really well. We're going to try another one of these actually this year uh, for our uh, National Moss Week so the Friday of National Moth Week. I'm forgetting what date that is. It's the last Friday in July. If you would like to see one of these, uh, we're going to do another one of these um, because they're they're really fun and it's just a really good way to allow people to see a lot of different things in a, a kind of compact amount of time. Okay, so we went from doing all in-person, experiential, hands-on, outdoor learning to entirely online. Um, and having to make everything completely virtual and as interactive as we could. Um, and then we opened again. Uh, so we reopened in September of 2020, um, and there were so many restrictions about what we could and couldn't do uh, in person that it was, it was really tricky. Um, so I went back to this idea that these program goals that I'd had pre-COVID were all going to just kind of come back. Um, that we were going to make all these programs hands-on experiential and in nature, that people would learn natural history content, they're going to learn skills, and that they're going to walk away able to do a citizen science project on their own. Uh, so, you know, thought was, we're just going back to the way it was before. The reality is, that was not going to happen. Um, people were in a completely different mind frame after COVID uh, than they were before. And so, you know, what we had always done had always done was just not going to work in this new reality. I mean, we had a lot of restrictions. You know, we had to wear masks um, at all of our programs when we were first able to offer them. And we had to stay socially distanced. You know, all these things were really important. Uh, so we couldn't have people in our outdoor classroom. And we don't actually do all of our programs in our outdoor classroom anyway. Um, but, you know, we couldn't be in the outdoor classroom really at all. Um, we had to face people out on our trails really far. We had to require that everyone wear masks. And of course, not everyone wanted to do that. Uh, and so there were a lot of issues, you know, just getting people to come. Um, there were a lot of people that didn't feel comfortable being out in public at all, even in an outdoor space. And so a lot of our audience that we had before COVID were just not interested in doing things with us in person yet. Uh, and so it was just a very, very different experience. You know, people were still really scared about being around other people, uh, which meant that a lot of people stayed away. And then we had other people that were mad about our restrictions. And so it was just an adventure and a mess. And you all know that this this happened. This happened everywhere. Everyone's site had, had these kind of things come up. Um, so we started thinking about offering kind of some slightly different opportunities. So rather than having these, you know, scheduled in-person programs, 
we shifted to um, doing a lot more kind of self-led experiences. And so um, we started offering uh, scavenger hunts as kind of our first programs because people could come, they could grab a scavenger hunt sheet from a table without having to be near anyone else. They could stay in their bubble uh, and move around the grounds, you know, on their own without having to be close to anyone else. And those actually were super popular in a way that I had not expected. Um, you know, we would get um, dozens and dozens of people coming to those programs when we were expecting, you know, like two or three people to show up. Uh, we also had a backpack program for citizen science projects before COVID where people could basically on their honor, grab a backpack out of our, our bin, um, learn about a citizen science project, collect some data, and then return things when they were done. And we weren't allowed to, um, let people share those kinds of things. And so we transitioned those into kind of virtual backpack experiences so people could scan a QR code and get the same kinds of things that they were getting in the pack. They didn't have necessarily some of the equipment that was included in the pack, like our, our bird pack had a pair of binoculars in it, for example. Um, but they could still learn about the project. They could still see the maps and things that we were using. Um, they could still fill out a data sheet online rather than you know, on a paper data sheet. And so we were trying to kind of duplicate that experience, but in a, a more virtual space. And then we also started doing story trails at Prairie Ridge. Uh, and so these were um, kind of like story walks. We did have story walks also. Those are technically trademarked and those are um, actual official, you know, story books that are posted along a trail so that you can read um, the pages as you walk. So we created story trails that were not storybooks. Uh, and so I created multiple of them, one for uh, Eco Explorer, we did one, this one for the City Nature Challenge, where people could follow along a series of, of signs and uh, learn how to do a citizen science project as they went. We kept doing virtual programs after we reopened. Um, there were a lot of people that really were enjoying the virtual programs. We had a very large audience for them, and so we didn't want to stop doing them. Uh, we are still doing the Eco Explorer virtual programs. Um, we still have a very, very good, strong audience for those Eco Explorer ones. Uh, I started doing fewer of those Citizen Science Adventure videos, um, but then we started adding lecture series for adults. Um, so we did um, a series uh, called Misunderstood Monsters last October that was all about, you know, debunking myths related to um, animals that people tend to not like, you know, like crows and, and snakes and spiders and things uh, started doing a lot more um, a lot more of those kinds of things where you know we're inviting people to join us in an evening to learn something pretty in depth but also get some citizen science um, information and then we kind of slowly started adding in-person programs back in um, and um, you know, we had to work around all the restrictions. So of course we were very spread out at first and then we could get a little bit closer together and then people could take off their masks. Um, but, you know, we we're, we're kind of slowly, even still kind of bringing these, these in-person programs back in. So what we're doing now, um, we're doing a blend of a whole ton of different types of projects. So we're still doing virtual programs for basically ages five and up. Um, it depends a little bit on the program, which audience we're going for, but um, most of them tend to be open at pretty much all ages, uh, but are really kind of ideal for the non, the non really like early childhood people. Uh, we are doing a blend of um, structured in-person programs and unstructured in-person programs. So structured are ones where we have like a, a planned um, series of activities that we want to do and a time that we want people to show up and unstructured tend to be much more um, drop in friendly, like we'll uh, just invite people to come out and use our bug nets for, you know, half an hour or something. And um, they can go running around with the net for a while and kind of do their own thing. Uh, and then we're continuing to do some of these self-led experiences because we still have people that are not interested in coming to in-person scheduled programs. Uh, but this gives us an opportunity to let people still participate without necessarily having to um, join a program. So with all of this in mind, we do have new complications that we have run into. Uh, one is that our audience has changed. So the people that wanted to come to our programs before COVID 
a lot of them haven't come back. Um, so we're really kind of looking at a new audience uh, and we're looking at an audience that has had this COVID experience uh, that has kind of changed the way they approach the world uh, in a pretty big way. And the preferences of our audience have really changed. Um, you know, before, if I wanted to offer, you know, a four hour, you know, half day workshop on how to identify dragonflies and de-citizen science of dragonflies, you know, that would sell out. Um, and I'm having a hard time actually getting this to fill at this point. Uh, so things have definitely changed since before COVID. Um, so right now, an ideal program, like the one where we're going to get the most people have um, certain characteristics. So one is that perfect weather has to be a thing. If it is too hot, too cold, it might rain, it's too windy, any little thing that makes the weather less than perfect means that people will not show up. Um, and so the, the weather's always been an issue for us because we don't have an indoor space. Um, but right now people are not willing to put up with slightly less than perfect weather. Um, we also have found that programs that have an exact start time are not very well attended. Um, you know, if we want to have a, a, hour or two hour or three hour long program and it has an exact start time, half the people are going to show up at least 10 to 20 minutes late. And some people are going to show up halfway through the program and have missed the whole first half. Uh, so we're having issues convincing people that they should come at a certain time. Um, and even bigger issues having people actually show up on time when we do have a program that has a, a set time. Um, and we're also finding that people are really enjoying having the freedom to explore on their own a lot more than sitting down and having like a, a class. Um, so we want to, when we can, provide opportunities for them to kind of go out on their own a little bit and find their own way of exploring whatever we're looking at for the day, uh, rather than giving them an exact set of activities that we're going to do. So this is kind of our biggest bang for our buck. Not all of our programs are doing this. We're still offering some of those scheduled programs. We're still offering the in-depth programs that have a little bit more um, content. And um, we're definitely doing other things than just this. But if we want a perfect program where a lot of people show up, these are kind of the three things that we really need to have. Perfect weather, flexible scheduling, and freedom for the, um, the attendees to explore, but on their own. So all that is to say, I have kind of five requirements for our post-COVID programming um, that we're trying to keep in mind whenever we do a, a, a program these days. Uh, and I think a lot of these things are, are helpful for other people to think about as well. So one is that what worked before the pandemic may not work now. And one example is my Firefly Watch program. Uh, this has always been my most popular program. It's not my biggest program necessarily. Um, some of my events are bigger than this, but this is my biggest program. And I have always maxed it out to the total number of people that I as one single person can manage on my own and have typically set the limit at like 70 people. We cram into the outdoor classroom. I give them, you know, 15 minutes worth of firefly knowledge. And then I set them loose to go watch fireflies out on the prairie. And it has always been very, very, very popular. It sells out every time um, I have like standing room only in our classroom. Post COVID, I cannot get people to come to this, um, which I find shocking because I know people love fireflies. I had 2000 people, over 2000 people show up to my virtual firefly night but I can't get people to come to this program anymore. Um, so I'm having to rethink the way I'm doing it and keep it a lot more open than I used to, a little bit less class-like, a little bit more just kind of free form, let people go wander around the prairie looking at fireflies kind of thing. Um, we are having to make any changes necessary to meet the new preferences of our audience. Uh, so one example is we did a program called Insectapalooza last year for our Eco Explorer kids. Uh, I had been scheduling all these in-person programs and couldn't get any of the kids to actually come uh, to any of our like scheduled programs. Uh, so I did this Insectapalooza, this is kind of free flowing, 
I'm going to get out all of our insect nets, all of our field guides, um, be available to answer questions, and then just let kids go with bug boxes. And they wandered around the prairie and collected bugs. And um, I basically trained them how to use the bug nets and let them loose. And so many people showed up to this. So I couldn't get them to come to, you know, a scheduled program that was still going to have really fun activities. But if I changed it to this big open free form thing where they didn't have to show up at an exact time, you know, I got lots and lots of people to come. We are having to accept unpredictability. Um, so it's hard to predict how many people are going to come to a program these days. So what we used to do for our big events, uh, like if we had our um, Fairy Gnome Day, for example, we could look at Facebook, see how many people were interested, divide that by 10, and that was about the number of people that we would expect at a program. So, you know, if 5,000 people saw or said they were interested in the program, 500 people would show up. And that was really reliable. Like we could almost guess to the exact number how many people were going to come. That is not true anymore. Um, sometimes you have this whole big program plan and three people show up. And other times, like our Winterfest program, we were expecting about 100 people and 400 people showed up. Uh, and so we ended up having parking issues. We ran out of materials. This is the, the wreath making station. Um, the people at the wreath making station were running around like crazy. We were making wreaths out of um, invasive plants. So they were cutting things like as fast as they um, could to have enough materials for these people that were coming. So we just have to plan in a very different way. You know, think about the fact that we could have, you know, three or four or five times as many people as we are expecting, but we could also have basically zero people show up, which just makes it really tricky to plan. But we're having to think in this much more expansive way about what that audience is going to look like and what we could potentially get. Um, flexibility and adaptation are more important than ever. And you all know that being able to adapt a program on the fly or accept the fact that, you know, a venomous snake crosses your path and, you know, mass chaos ensues for a little while while you, you deal with that and teach the, the people in your group about that animal, even if it wasn't the topic of the day. Uh, so you all know that this is what we do. Like we're flexible and we adapt our programs all the time, but I think this has become even more important. Uh, so, for example, I had this whole program I was so excited about where I was going to um, teach our Eco Explorer kids about bats and then have them build these paper bats that we were going to shoot with the stomp rocket. And I knew, I knew these kids would want to do this. But because I had a scheduled time for this program and the weather ended up being slightly less than perfect that day, it was kind of a little bit rainy and I told everyone even that we were going to move it into our outdoor classroom which is covered so they were not going to get wet uh, no one showed up to that program and I was so disappointed because I was really excited about launching paper bats with the snop rocket uh, so I ended up transitioning that program into another eco explorer program um, our one of our season summits and so I basically just shifted it into another program where I knew more people were likely to come and so just adapted that by kind of moving it into a different space. Um, but, you know, just being ready to, to deal with whatever comes has become even more important than ever. And then I also feel very strongly that virtual is a really sustainable and accessible option. You know, we can reach so many more people in so many more places with virtual programs than we can in person. And while I do love taking people outdoors, I still love taking people outdoors and giving them that hands-on experience in nature. Having this virtual option is really great for a lot of people that either can't get to your site because they're too far away, uh, they have mobility issues and can't um, move around your site, they just don't want to be around other people. You know, this just gives so many more people the opportunity to actually interact with your, your programs. Uh, so our, our Misunderstood Monsters program, that was um, actually led by my staff person uh, last October. You know, we had a lot of people that were very interested in that program. You know, it was at 7 p.m. Uh, on a Wednesday, I think. So it was like just a kind of regular weeknight kind of program. But we had a really, really huge turnout for that. And the number of people that join a program really depends um, on the time of year. Um, I know Chris and I were talking before the program started about, you know, the audience crashes and burns after um, school gets out for a little while. 
So you have this huge dip right after school gets out uh, and then it goes back up, but you you get these fluctuations, but there are people that definitely still want virtual programs uh, and being able to offer them, I think to me, gives me an opportunity to talk to more people in more places and very different ways uh, than just our in-person programs. And for us as a state museum, I like being able to reach everyone in the state, like anyone anywhere in North Carolina and anyone outside of North Carolina can join our programs. And so we have a a much greater reach than we, we have before. All right. So that's what I have to share today. But what I would really love to do with the rest of the time that we have, um, and it looks like we have about 15 minutes, I would really love to hear experiences that other people have had with programs either during or after COVID. Uh, So if you've experienced any of the same kinds of issues that we have, um, if you have any suggestions for other EE type people or other educators for um, how you've done something very successfully, um, any sort of challenges that you've faced, I would really love to hear from people in the audience because I think it's, it's very nice to know that you're not alone. Um, it's nice to hear from other people that have found something that works, um, particularly now that we live in this kind of weird chaotic space where um, your audience is completely different. Um, and so I would, I would love to hear from other people if anyone has anything to share. Well, first, everybody, let's give Chris Goforth a great big round of applause wherever you happen to be, or you can drop little clapping hands emojis into the chat to express your appreciation. Great stuff, Chris. Uh, Very insightful. And I appreciate that we wound up with some like really solid recommendations there at the end uh, and insights. Like, I I like how deeply that you've, you've thought about this. Uh, And maybe that's just me, like as a programmer also here at the museum, trying to do stuff and get people to come to it uh, and having been doing this for the last several years similarly, but, you know, in, in different veins and in different ways. Um, really interesting to see it laid out here, you know, in the last 40 minutes. I will encourage everybody to drop your thoughts, questions into the chat. And uh, some of the first stuff that showed up, Chris, was people who participated in moth night just talking about how much fun it was excellent <clears throat> yeah i i really love doing those programs <laughs> for me um i'm calling them distributed virtual programs um and uh i just i think they're so fun to do and um i really hope that people in the audience get a really good experience because they're getting to hear from so many different people instead of just you know, me talking the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's see. Well, one of those people was Jerry Reynolds, who uh, who also wrote that he wanted to see behind the curtain. But I think Jerry knows what it uh, looks like. Behind the curtain. <laughs> I can show people behind the curtain if you want. It's just very terribly backlit. And it's my coworker's um, <laughs> desk that's, you know, four feet away from my desk. So it's not very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so let me see. I've, I've got a, a bunch of chat started rolling in. So let me find my place real quick. Um, so Jerry also had made the comment, which I think is interesting, that many of his adult participants were happy to return to in-person field experiences for the lifelong hikes and adventures that he leads, which is an interesting contrast to the types of programs that you're offering at Prairie Ridge. Yeah. Um, I think it depends a lot on your particular audience. Um, I, I, yeah, um, that's not what we're seeing, uh, but Mm -hmm. I'm glad that it's working for some people (laughs) Um, (laughs) because, you know, we're, we're having a really hard time getting adults to come to our programs. Uh, You know, my staff person and I do a lot of programs for adults um, and we're having a really, really hard time getting people that actually show up. Um, And I know what we're offering are good things, their content that people want you know like i i know my audience really well like i know what kinds of information people want for us to present and and we're we're doing that but getting them to actually show up has been really really tricky now jerry's programs though 
do take people to really cool places. Um, and it's this great, you know, field trippy kind of thing. Like we're asking people to come to Prairie Ridge. Um, and so they're driving here, you know, they're having to commit to, you know, coming here and stay at this one site. And we're not, I mean, it's, it's a great place. I love it here, but we're not going to, you know, see Venus flytraps or, you know, spring ephemerals and, you know, really cool, cool things in other parts of the state. So I wonder if that plays into Jerry's experience a bit. I would wonder that too. Uh, Let's see. Uh, Another commenter, Jonathan Marshall, wrote that, like Jerry mentioned, our adult audiences have been very excited to have in-person programs back. We've been continuing to utilize Zoom for lecture portions of our classes to accommodate large numbers and then offer smaller field courses for the hands-on portions. Excellent. Actually just did a program with Jonathan not too long ago. Last weekend. (laughs) Last last weekend. which again, it's uh, I want it. It seems like 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 if Jonathan is having some success here, and then like m- the your programs are like finding success some of the time, but then struggling in others. Like it seems like the analysis has to become even more fine gr- uh, fine tooth or fine grained, smaller grain. I don't. What am I saying? Uh, more detailed in order to pick apart like what people are getting how they're hearing about it what the expectations are like exactly what somebody does on a program to try to figure out what the differences are because it's not like i think you're doing a bad job your programs obviously were fantastic and would draw out all kinds of people but like the very specific things that must have changed it almost seems like uh randomness like it's just random anymore i don't know yeah i i I feel that way too it's just in some ways it's frustrating to me when i'm offering something that i know is like a really good program and no one shows up (laughs) like come on people like if you just came you would this would be an amazing experience but you know trying to convince people to actually you know leave their house and come to a site and be outside and if the weather's not exactly perfect you know like it's been very hot recently so convincing anyone to go outside has been a little tricky and that's always been true, but I think it's even more more true now. Like people are less willing to put up with discomfort or and inconvenience, I think, than they were before. I, I have wondered that. Uh, let me get to some more chat questions here. Uh, the EE office folks actually jumped in too because they do some of this stuff as well. They wrote that virtual and independent study can still get people outside. Teacher Ed here at the museum developed a great Criteria Two series that's still used by EE certification participants. And as far as professional development for EE certification, we still want people to get outside, but the virtual options have expanded access. We're seeing a good balance of the two. Yeah, that's that's why I keep doing virtual programs because, well, I like doing them in the first place and I've always wanted to do them, but um, I... I feel strongly that that allows people a lot more opportunity to interact with the things that we have to share. Um, And if we can make things more accessible to more people, that is always worthwhile. Yeah. And they also mentioned um, that people's schedules might just be different now. Uh, uh, Folks aren't on Monday to Friday, eight to five types of schedules anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, it just changes what people are available to do or, or willing to go out and do as well. Yeah. Well, and you know, people are doing a lot more work from home and so everyone's on zoom a lot more. So, you know, sometimes maybe people are just zoomed out for the day um, by the time, you know, one of our, our virtual programs start. Um, but they, they, yeah, everything just seems so much more chaotic than it used to be. Like there used to be this very this routine that everyone had and some people have managed to get back to those routines, but I think a lot of other people haven't. Agreed. Agreed. I mean, you know, I looking at these comments and people who are like agreeing with some of this stuff. And then I think about like my, my own life back at work and back at home and post pandemic and, you know, work from home days. And then the stuff that I'm willing to go out and do say at the end of a work day or on a weekend, is also very different than than what it used to be. Yeah, so so many things change, which is the way people interact with other people. Um, 
post COVID, you know, it's, it's a whole new world <laughs> compared to what we had before. What do you think it means for those of us in the world of getting people outside? Because I see, I see two things. I, I see so many more people who go outdoors who take advantage of green space and nature space like parks, places like Prairie Ridge, uh, state parks, county parks, all of that. Uh, and at the same time, it seems like it's hard to get people out of their homes. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I think for us, you know, we've kind of found the sweet spot with offering those very kind of loosely organized programs where, you know, we just kind of have this fun thing that people can come do. And we're trying to make them as educational as possible, but allowing people to have kind of that self-led experience that I think a lot of, at least a lot of our audience is really craving, you know, they don't necessarily want to sit down and do a class like that's, that's too formal for a lot of people. But, you know, if we get the bug nets out and let them loose, you know, a lot more people are interested in doing those kinds of things. So they're still getting that kind of outdoor experience. It's just different than what we had before. So we're just having to kind of think about doing things a little bit differently than we used to, like incorporating a little bit more of that kind of personal time into the programs that we had, you know, where we used to go out as a big group and, and do those things together. Like this, now I'm kind of letting people wander around on their own a little bit more than we used to. And that that's working um, pretty well for the people that come to those programs. So just thinking about ways to adapt things to fit the the needs of the audience um, has been a big part of what we've been trying to do. Jerry added that uh, Jerry loves the virtual programs. They are more accessible, but also loves that many of them are recorded. And so you can go back to them, which kind of gets at what you're just talking about. Like, why would I go sit in a classroom for one, two hours to learn something when either it's going to be online and I can watch it from home live, or I can watch it whenever I want to, because pretty much everything gets recorded and put on the web now, because we've all learned how to do this as a result of our virtual program experience. Yeah. Every time I have a virtual program and not all that many people show up, I try to remind myself that I have been that person that didn't show up because I'm waiting to get the recording later. Um, <laughs> yep. So even if I only have like five people in a program, I'm still going to do it because I know other people will watch it later. <laughs> yeah. And there's still, it seems like there's still, uh, and we're, we're getting close to time too. It seems like there's, there's still benefit to doing the program, even with a very tiny audience. It's almost like there's something to having it on the calendar, having it on the schedule, because you can maybe you can build a new audience. Like you're still putting the content out there. You're still putting the expertise and the opportunity out there. And kind of like, and you said it, uh, right? Finding, you're getting new audiences for things and finding the people who do want to do that, even if it is a smaller audience than it used to be. Yeah, and I think, you know, some of our programs have been way bigger than we ever expected and others have been way smaller. So, you know, it, it's all, it, it, there's just so many new factors, I think, that are going into people's decisions about whether they're coming to something or not. Um, it's just, it, it's just hard to predict. Um, yeah. Like, I, I'm fine with a, a small audience. This is frustrating when, you know, you're planning for 30 people and get, you know, three people or you're planning for, you know, 10 people and you get 50 people. Um, so, you know, just having to, to be ready for that kind of unpredictability is tricky, but it's what we're having to do. So, uh, some people in the chat are wanting to know how they can find out about upcoming programs like the moth night you mentioned that'll be at the end of July. Yeah. Um, so, um, we put all of our Prairie Ridge programs on our Facebook page, so you can follow us there. Um, you can also find them on the museum's, um, website. Uh, the MOSS program, the virtual one is going to actually be part of, um, actually Jonathan Marshall that commented earlier, uh, and I lead a, pro a group called Science Across NC, where we have a bunch of, um, EE centers that are working as a collaborative to promote um, citizen science through these kind of um, large scale events. Uh, and so there's a number of us through Science Across NC that are going to do that that virtual MOSS program. Um, so you can find out about that and other 
um, moth programs through uh, scienceacrossnc.org if you want to follow the activities of our collaborative group. Excellent stuff. Perfect. Chris, thanks for being on the program today. Yeah, thank you so much. Glad to be here. Awesome stuff. Incredible insights. Uh, and and now I'm like, I'm going to send you a calendar invite and we're going to have a meeting, please. And we'll just <laughs> we'll solve all of, all of these things that we're dealing with across all we of We can our- do that. <laughs> just, we just get us all in a it's uh we all work in the same place but we get us all in one room maybe we can actually uh we'll get it all done we can fix all of our problems okay uh let's see i gotta get out of here it's one o'clock everybody thanks for tuning in to the lunchtime discovery series we'll see you again in two weeks we won't be here next week uh we're going to take next Wednesday off because of the proximity to the july 4th holiday so uh well happy july 4th everybody We won't be here next week. Uh, Enjoy your holiday. But we will be back here on Wednesday, July 12th with another presentation by, oh, oh, wait, that one's me. Yeah, I'll actually be doing the slideshow that week. So, uh, you know, come to that one. Don't come to that one. I don't know. I'll be telling you all the secrets behind the scenes gossip here at the Museum of Natural Sciences. So don't miss out. That's Wednesday, July 12th. Uh, See y'all soon. Take care. Be well, be kind. We'll see you again later. Bye, everybody.